So for today's class, we'll be focusing on topic two. Last week, I hope you guys remember, we were looking at CVP. We looked at cost definition, cost allocation, cost characteristics in terms of how do you classify them and how do they behave. We looked at those elements last week, which was under topic one. So it was three units into one. That's how we're going to be doing our lessons, just focusing on a topic and then the units behind it. So I hope you guys um, understood the topic. If you have any questions, please do ask. Um, I will give you guys time so that we can go through any questions that you might have related to last week's lesson. For this week, we are focusing on accounting for material labor and overheads. All right. So last week we were talking about what a material is, what labor is, and what constitute overheads. So now we're talking about how to account for them. When I went through this unit, um, I realized that it has a lot of accounting principles and also auditing. So if you are doing accounting and also auditing, you'll feel like the topic is a bit familiar. This is where they intersect together. Um, cool. So let's start. As I've mentioned, we're going to look at material, labor, and overhead. Those are the units under this topic. Under material, we'll be looking at material recording procedures, accounting entries, um, inventory planning and control. And under inventory planning and control, we're looking at what are those costs for carrying your inventory and what are the costs related to ordering your inventory. And then we try to find the sweet spot between inventory carrying and ordering cost, which is the economic order quantity. All right. So as we start, we look at what material is. Material is the physical materials that are converted into the product. And uh, we spoke about it. If you want to make a disc, it's your wood. If you want to make your, what, um, what can I use? If you want to make a sweater, it's the, the materials, the cotton cloth that you're going to use in order to make that. So that's material, right? It's at the very start, it's the input into the process of you uh, producing your product. Okay. So part of recording procedures, this part is familiar to what you have in auditing. When you purchase the material, um, firstly, there should be a need, right? Firstly, it will be the procurement department saying that we need uh, five wood for our desk, for instance. And there will be a requisition form that's being filled up to say that this is what we need. And the suppliers will come. And when they come, they will deliver those uh, materials, the raw materials that you guys need to make desk. I'm going to stick to the desk example because it's easier. <laughs> By the warehouse, that's where you will store your wood, right? Someone will come from your suppliers, deliver the goods, you sign, good receive note, um, and then you will store those goods. So now, as you go along, there's certain general entries, we'll go into it later, that the accounting department will have to capture to show that you have stock on hand that you've paid. And by the end of the year, you would need to do a, or some people it will be at the end of the month, they will have to do an inventory stock count. This is when you look at what you have on your books in terms of inventory versus uh, what's on the floor. When I say on the floor, I mean at the warehouse the warehouse, how many wood would you guys have compared to what you have in your books? Books meaning that the minute that those guys came and delivered the wood, someone would have captured to say that we received five, right? And then now, um, at the end of the month, we have to do a stock count. 
which is critical in order to check the balance of your inventory at the end of the month, because that's what's being reported, right? Um, you would think of accounting. Accounting says that your closing balance of your inventory, what is it? So that's the purpose of an inventory count at the end of the month or end of the year. All right. Um, so other th the other thing, this way, um, management accounting and accounting, uh, financial accounting intersect. It talks about, I, I remember in IS2, which is a standard for inventory, they talk about, so as I was saying, um, IS2, it would say that um, your costs needs to be all cost incurred to get your inventory to the stage that it is at the moment. So when they say all costs, these are the costs for acquiring, for instance, I'm talking about material. This is the cost of acquiring that material, meaning the wood that you have bought, and all other costs incurred in getting that material into the current place and condition. This is very important that, um, that you understand, which I'm emphasizing, the fact that it's all costs. Let me use a laser point. Cool. It's all cost incurred in getting that unit of material into its current place and condition. So what are these? These are remember I told you that by the procurement, I mean by the warehouse, suppliers invoice would be have been given. There's transportation, those people, the supplier coming into the warehouse, they are using uh, transportation, right? So those transportation costs that got um your material to the warehouse. And in instances where you are importing goods from China or overseas, I'm going to make China as an example. Um, the cost, obviously, it's not like that wood just came overnight. It could be via a ship. So if it, that's shipping cost, there's customer duty. So it's all cost that that got your material into the current place and condition, and condition. Remember that it might be that when you are buying this wood from China or from wherever, then it's coming via ship. There might be some insurances that you pay in to ensure that your material comes into a good condition where you can use. So that's why I'm saying that don't... Um, underestimate the statement that says that all costs incurred to get your material into the current place. So you're looking where the place is. So I'm making an example of a warehouse. So the cost incurred to bring to that current place would be transportation and the condition. So in, this would be more evident if you're reading your question. They will hint um, as to how did that material get to the current place? Right. Okay. So after explaining to you what the material is and what are those costs that you have to consider, we're looking at the accounting entries. All right. So Please bear with me, especially with today's lesson. It's a bit of theory because as I've mentioned, and probably you guys do auditing or financial accounting. It's a bit of more theory, but I'll, I try to include activities so that you can relate and then we can discuss. And um, just like last week, let's try to interact. I will ask you questions just to see your thought process when it comes to answering these questions. Um, the material inventory control account. So, this is what the accountant will have, right? A, a control account that will monitor um, monetary values, meaning what you pay, what's being paid, what's being transferred to the next stage. Because remember that material is at the very beginning of your production process. So that material would be, um, there might be any labor involved, or I'm just saying that it will be converted into um, into another space where it will lead you to having a final product. So 
you would have a control account. And so the minute that you've received your material, you debit that material inventory control account, because remember, this is an asset. And then it depends how you paid for that inventory. You would then credit, because it's a cash outflow, either your bank, if it's cash, or your account payables, it means that you are paying at a later stage. It's like paying a creditor, right? So this journal is for when you have received that uh, material, okay? Um, and then now, as I've mentioned, um, as I've mentioned, materials are at the very beginning. They might be issued into production, right? So when raw material is issued to production, the direct material is recorded as a work in progress. I hope that you guys understand. It's a work in progress because we are working towards having a finished product, right? So how do you account for it? This is the journal. Please do not underestimate these journals. It might be that, oh, okay, fin financial accounting on one. They do come up normally as part of your multiple choice. We will have a chance to look at past papers as we go along with the lessons. You will see that these questions, they come as a multiple choice. So that when you understand the general entries, it's easier to answer the uh, multiple choice so that you can score marks, right? Um, so getting back to this about working progress. Um, so for example, they say consumables like stationery issued to sales department will be allocated to non-manufacturing overheads. Material and supplies requisitions are summarized and recorded as below. So you would debit your work in progress with your direct material and whatever that's indirect material, this is where now the classification comes into play. You would then debit your uh, manufacturing overheads and any other consumables. They will go to your non-manufacturing. And then you take it out of this control account. Because remember, for every debit, there's a credit. So when you take out from the material control account, this is where you would be allocating it. And for you to allocate where your raw material will be issued, you need to understand how your costs behave, right? Can you trace this cost to what you are trying to do? What I'm trying to say is that, can you see this wood as part of the desk? Yes, I do. So if it's, that's the case, I take that wood cost to my work in progress account and then there's indirect material as part of what makes that desk this will be your needles i mean your but your nails no not needles your nails the nails that you put on the desk you take them to manufacturing overheads because remember from last week indirect material it's part of the manufacturing overhead then you would have other consumables these are not really anything that to do with the production, but it's a cost that you've incurred that relates to uh, the material that you have. Those ones you take it to non-manufacturing overheads. I hope that makes sense. So firstly, it's when you have received. The second part is when you are issuing this material and you are transferring it to the next stage of production. Um, this one relates to when you have returned from production. So it's something that you need to also know as to when do you debit and when do you take it out. So when you are returning it, remember this when you received it, this is when you issue it. But when you return it, you return it back to this control account. So you debit and you credit everything that you've done because now you are retaining it. Some instances when you return, is when you found out that your material is not of good condition. So it's delaying the production. So once it's been identified as that, you take it out of where you've allocated it when you were issuing it and return it back to the control account for your material so that you can return it to the store or wherever you've bought your material. 
all right so let's 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 go to uh activity 4.1 you guys have you model so let's go to activity 4.1 okay cool so it's a simple example it says that to illustrate this everything that we've spoken about the following balances were taken from books of indaga limited for march these are the balances that you have at the beginning of the month your material inventory control is 4000 your working progress is 16000 and your account payable is 30 the transactions for march they tell you the material purchased on check uh, on credit is 30, 38 30, 38500 materials that were issued they they then classify it in terms of direct material and indirect material and they tell you that the company uses perpetual um this one it helps you to monitor the movement of your inventory so can you guys prepare the general entries in the t account for the month of march i will try give you five minutes and then we can then discuss in terms of your thought process around this it's very i'm just saying that it's very direct it's similar to what i just explained so if you don't mind i'll give you five minutes should be enough for you guys to just do a T account to show me what would you debit, what would you credit, just to account for what happened this month. Okay, cool. I'll give you five minutes. Can you just start telling us what your general entries are for the month? Okay, sure. Um, my name is Marika, but it's fine. Okay, yeah. I really don't mind. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I'm started with uh, with, uh, with the first one, the actual material purchased on credit, yes. which is then uh, the, you debit your inventory control account and you credit your accounts payable Straight. with the 38,500. Yes. So then the next entries are uh, for the material issued throughout the month. Um, I, 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 I like to break it down, so I yeah. don't combine the two. So um, I debited the uh, WIP, uh, the work in progress, Yes. Uh, and then credited the inventory control account because of the fact that it is direct material. And then uh, I debited manufacturing overheads and credited uh, the inventory control account. So, oh. is 27,500 and the manufacturing overheads is 2,000. Okay, so you break it down and, and not. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, I don't. I don't combine. It's just it's just a personal habit that I just to make sure that I do actually I <laughs> do all of them. <laughs> I get yeah. you. I get you. I get you. It makes yeah. it easier so that you can see for each debit yes. as a credit. Oh, yeah. It's a clean one. All right. I'm happy with your general interest. Thank you, Marika. Um any question around this one? It was very direct, just to show that this is what we received, this is what we purchased, right? It's the receiving of those materials of 38,500. And then we split it in terms of what's being issued into production. So as you can see, it's not the total amount that was purchased that's being taken into production. So the, this is what's being taken to the whip. And indirect material, it's part of the manufacturing overheads. And that's the bit that goes there. And because you are issuing it into production, you have to take it out from your inventory control account. So I'm happy with that. So I'm happy with your thought process as direct as I've mentioned. Please do not, as I still repeat, don't underestimate these journals. Know them by head because multiple choice, they do ask them often. So... The T account, because it's a bit long, um, I just want us to look at it um, together. That this is T account, we start looking at what will be remaining in the accounts affected by this whole journal that we just did. Okay. 
So for material inventory control account, remember we do have an opening balance at the beginning of the month, this one. So you show that you have 4,000 from the previous month that we carry on into March. And guess what? We did debit, we did meet and manufact, I mean, we did receive material. We did purchase material for this current month during the month of 38,500. And we took a portion of it. We've issued it into production. This is the whip part. This is the um, overheads. And then what's being balanced is what will be carried forward into the next month. I hope that's straightforward for you guys. And then under whip, we do have an opening balance under whip. And here it is from the previous month, we carry on into March. And then there were raw materials that were being transferred for part of the production. That is the 27 day. So it links. And then account pay payable, there were, it's, a, it's a credit account, right? So we also had a balance day that was carried forward. And we're also showing that we just made a purchase this month. And then in terms of manufacturing overhead, there was no balance day. So here it is, it's first one for the month, the 2000 allocation. So it's it just shows your flow of accounts. That's why I'm saying that it's a bit of accounting. But for you as a management accountant, you need to understand how your inventory flows and where it, where it is in terms of um, accounts, where in terms of phases of production, so that you can be able to do what? Control your cost. Because remember, management accountant, what they do is that you give value to your uh, stakeholders because you tell them how to cost, you tell them how much money are they making, so it's very important to understand which what's the phase of your product, where is it, and how are the books looking at the moment. When I say books, I mean those T accounts and the GLs, so that you can know uh, that okay, we just got stock now, but then is it is there a need for us to order more or what? And if we are ordering more, what are the costs associated with ordering costs? So that's what I'm saying. That's why we covered this part of saying that understand what goes on in your accounting books. Cool. So speaking of control, the next part is inventory control management. One of the reasons we hold inventory are three of them, right? Transaction motive. This refers to holding inventory. Let me put my laser point. This refers to holding inventory for day-to-day -day use in the production process or for sales, where the supplier might not be able to supply at short notice. Right. Um, can any one of you maybe give me an example from what I've, I've just explained? This is this company would be holding inventory for day-to-day -day use because they they're not quite sure that the supplier can meet their demands at short notice. Can you guys think of anything? Why would a company hold this inventory for such a purpose? Why would they be motivated to hold their inventory? I just need an example that you can think of. Okay, Marek is saying Samsung phones that must be imported from Korea. Yes, because uh, when are you going to get your, it, it, it can't be that once your Samsung phones have, um, they are gone and there's this demand, people are still coming to the store. You can't just call people from Korea and say that I need five phones or 10 phones to come now. So what you would do is that you would have a transaction motive because now you need to have stock on hand, right? Because of the distance sorry, the distance that it takes and also a foreign uh, forex, foreign currency that is involved. You don't know how it's looking. So you need to plan proper before you get your stock. So I'd rather have the stock with you. 
Yes, thanks. Uh, Lizelle saying that having received payment. Okay, can you just elaborate a bit more? Who wouldn't have received payment? So that's a question that I'm posing to you. I'll just look out for your answer. Komocho, Jody, um, any input there? Do you guys know of any example that you can think of in terms of transaction motive? It can be a result of a past event, perhaps. Like you're saying, improper, pre- improper planning. Improper planning. Okay, cool. Yes. So it could be that based on past, past um, in your history with your supplier, sometimes it might be that the supplier doesn't deliver on time. Right. Yeah. So you rather cater and have your uh, inventory. Overstock and understock. Yes. Thank you. And then um, Lizelle saying that the supplier hasn't received payment. So, yes. So, in that terms, it would be a thing of trying to manage your cash outflows. Um, might be that at the time, maybe your supplier was not paid on time. So, chances are they're not going to bring the stock. So, you rather do a bulk purchase by the time that you um, make the order. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'm satisfied with your answers, guys. That's a transaction motive. Precautionary motive. This refers to holding extra inventory when future demand is uncertain and or the supply is unreliable. Oh, so now the one that we were speaking about, Judy, it's actually a precautionary motive. This is when your supplier is unreliable. Chances are they might not come based on the history that you have. So in that instance, you you hold your stock, right? You have extra. Then the speculative motive, this refers to holding more or less inventory than usual because a change in the supplier price is anticipated. So it happens a lot. I think that um, it would be in instances where by, let's say, you have a certain fixed contract with someone and it happens that now that contract is going to live soon for you to re-enter into a new contract with your supplier. You know that chances are your costs are going to go up. So you rather hold more inventory than usual because you're anticipating an increase and you don't know what it would be. So while you guys are going to negotiate for that contract, you rather have stock in hand. Because if you're not happy with the terms of the negotiation, you can then try to look for another supply while you have stock on hand. Okay, so I hope it makes sense. Please note these things. They make sense as to why if somebody asks you a question as to just give us an opinion on how this company holds their inventory. Try to look at these three reasons as part of your tools to refer to. As to this might be the reason why this company holds more or holds less. Okay. So that would give you a better understanding as to why somebody would have a big fat uh, inventory closing balance. Okay. So um, when you're planning and controlling um, your inventory, the question is how much of it is required and when. So this is a matter of quantity and time. These are the fundamental factors when you're controlling your inventory. How much of it is required and when is it required? Quantity and time. We will look at the economic quantity order as we go along. And so when we are talking about when and how much of that inventory is required is because there are these two costs that are sometimes a burden for your income statement. So what I'm saying is that they might, they might make you not profitable because of you will be carrying all ordering costs. So let's try to look at what this entails. So inventory carrying or holding cost inventory carrying, these are relevant costs in keeping your inventory on the premises until you can take them to your warehouse or your storage, and then there's insurance, then there's obsolescence costs, right? 
These are relevant costs because they change in inventory levels. All right. So these are holding costs. These are so, like I've mentioned, storage costs. You've ordered, we've received, it's in your T account material inventory account. We've received stock. However, we now need to look as to, okay, fine, this amount of stock, how much space is it taking inside the warehouse? So if you've got a larger stock coming in, it's going to take more space. If it's taking more space, that means more storage cost that you pay on a monthly. And if that stock is sitting there, means more insurance you will be incurring because just having a lot of stock on the warehouse is sometimes a bit dangerous because you put yourself under situations where it might be stolen. And if there's a lot of stock that's just sitting there and not being used or being issued into production, let's say if it was not necessary for you to hold more stock, you might have cost of obsolescence. This is the case where now, by the time that you want to issue it into production, it's no longer in a good condition. So it becomes a write-off. It becomes uh, your cost. So I'm trying to make sure that you guys understand that. And then, sorry, there's ordering cost. This cost, these are the ones that we spoke about. It's all the cost that got your, um, your material to where it is at the moment, the current, so the current place, which is the warehouse. So it's the cost of the inventory itself, the delivery, transport cost, any admin that might be uh, required in order to prepare and process that order. So these costs will fluctuate if the order number or quantities fluctuate. So both of them are variable costs if you look at it because it depends on the inventory levels that are the, the quantity of the stock that we are dealing with. So we will look at activity 4.2. This will speak more about what we what we're looking at in terms of managing your carrying and ordering cost. But before we go with the um okay cool we can look at the side where's my laser sorry okay cool if purchases are made in small quantities the result will be frequent orders we know that right by now if you make small frequent orders that's what's going to happen and the more you order that means that you are increasing your ordering costs because sometimes your suppliers will give you a discount if you buy in bulk as opposed to just frequently going. So it's just like with you, when you doing your grocery shopping, there's certain items that you know that if I, let's say I'm going to speak about carbs, if I buy 5 kg of rice, that will last me for a whole month or two. It depends on how many people are inside the household. But rice is not something that you would want to always be going almost every single week going to buy rice, if you guys get what I mean. Because the more you go, that price will exceed, will exceed if you bought, will exceed the price of a 5 kg rice, which could have lasted you for the month. I hope you guys understand. And then the quantity to order at a given time should therefore be determined by balancing the following factors. So this quantity that we're speaking about, it needs to be balanced by looking at the total cost of carrying that inventory and then the cost of ordering. And then this thing will help you to look that if you are overstocked, your size order would be large. So that 5 kg that I was speaking about it would be large, that size, but the frequency of orders will be low and your annual ordering cost will be low However, your carrying cost, if it's in the warehouse, think about it, you need much more bigger space. So your carrying cost would be high. Inverse would be your understock. Understock, your orders are small, but you frequently going and asking this. Imagine all the time if you need more Samsung phones, you always have to go to Korea. As I've mentioned, the foreign exchange, that cost, would it's, it's always fluctuating. So you can't even get into hedge instruments or try to hedge against the fluctuation of that rent value against what's in Korea, their currency. Do you get what I mean? So 
your frequency would be high and those costs would be high too. But the warehouse space, your insurances, is very low. So you, you need to make sure that you can balance these two in order to meet that sweet spot where you are balanced. Um, yeah, okay, Sharp, let's go to activity 4.2. I hope you guys are following. Mm. Time is flying. So activity 4.2, we'll just look at it. It's a, it's a quick one, and then we can then move forward. Activity 4.2 speaks about how to, you need to calculate your average inventory on hand. So how you do that, average inventory on hand, you take half of the order size. That's how you find out what is the average that you need to have, right? So your orders, your order inventory in quantities of 100 every 10 days. So it's you order 100 inventories every 10 days. Usage occurs even less in quantity per day. How do you need to calculate your average inventory on hand? And how you do that is that you firstly have to understand what is the average usage per day. You take your order size, you divide it by how often do you make this order? So it's 10 units per day. So for you to calculate your average order uh, inventory on hand, I'd say just do your half, this one. Where you say that half your order size, that would be your average order. So when you have an average order, you can then see that how much is the stock on hand. And then while it decreases, you try to look at the number of days does it hit here which would be a soft spot in terms of while inventory is decreasing. Then you can then decide when you get here as to do I still order or do I what do I do at that time? Unlike with this one, if it goes down very quickly, this is when you'll know that this, this is the time that I need to start the restocking so that you don't get to this point and then you have to start all over again. Okay. Um, now we can look at the EOQ, which is the part that um, it's a formula that you can use in order to, sorry, it's a formula that you can use in order to know where's that balance that we were talking about. So the EOQ is the quantity of inventory to be ordered at one time in order to minimize both your annual ordering and your carrying costs. So this formula helps you to reduce your annual and uh, carrying costs, those storage costs that we were talking about. Um, so this is the point where your holding costs and your ordering costs are both equal. This is the formula. The formula is saying that um, it's actually like a square root. It's just that, I guess, they going all mathematical on you guys. But um, it just tells you what C is, which is the variable cost of placing that order. U is the annual usage, meaning the demand. It's the quantity of your order. H is the other variable for your holding cost. These are your storage costs, excluding the interest. And then I would be the interest. This will be provided, should be used when it's provided. If it's not, you don't use it. Then this would be your purchase price. All of this is just to understand where is that sweet spot where you have to order at that time, right? And the assumptions that we use is that your annual demand is known. So you know how much stock you need. Um, you know how often you will consume your stock. And there are no discounts. So there's no bulk purchases at this moment whereby it's associated with having a discount. And... You know your order cost, you know your carrying costs, and your stockouts are not intentional, right? So let's try to look at 4.3 and 4.5, and we do question 2 and 3, then closing this topic of material. As I've mentioned, it's a bit wordy. I think 
let's try a 4.3 please look at it at home because i'm looking at the time let's try 4.4 it should take you guys five minutes then we close this this um this topic when it comes to eoq i mean in terms of materials then you can go to labor all right, so Ngandla Limited consumes 1,000 kgs of materials per year. So they gave you the quantity. They told you this is no, okay? Let me not get too much into it. The variable ordering cost is five rand per order. So the ordering cost is known. The relevant annual carrying cost incurred was as follows. It's the warehouse rent, that's storage, theft and fire insurance, still part of carrying cost. The desired return on investment, it's 80 cents. So try and calculate the EOQ. Let's look at A only. So that should not even take you five minutes. It should take like three or two minutes. So let's say two minutes. Try and calculate the EOQ, then you guys can just text inside the chat box your answer. So we can go to question one and three. So it's gonna give you two minutes and then just put your answers in your chat box so that I can just see that you guys can apply the formula. Okay, I'm giving you guys two minutes, starts now. Lizel says 100 kg, what are the others saying? Just 100 kg. So it's straightforward. So you guys know how to use this one. Um, so as your homework, because I'm just, if we have time, we can come back to this. But as your homework, please do question two and three. That will be, please just ensure that you do it. It's it also helps you to close off the material um, part. There's journals, there's EOQ, so it's all this nice stuff. Okay, cool. Um, we go to labor. Labor, I won't lie, it was a bit more theory to just try to break it down so that you have an understanding as to what are the labor costs that gets into your books you know so there's stuff about tax there's uif there's um um cross income there's this there's. so i'll be just asking you guys just to check if we all understand them and then you can go to manufacturing over here okay so labor we done with material and just to wrap it up material we understand what it is we know how to account for it and we also know as to when to make an order, at what time and at the quantity that we need in order to make sure that we don't have a situation of uh, not having enough stock or having higher ordering cost and carrying cost. So that was the brief of what we just covered. In terms of labor, we look at labor cost controls. So there's HR department that is involved. There's timekeeping department. Timekeeping, they look at um, what time did you come in? What time were you productive? What time were you idle? All those and what actually contributes to that. There's the time clock method. When you tag in, tag out of a place, we look at that, which sometimes got us into trouble. Um, yeah, but I'll tell you guys later. Then there's the salary of payroll department. Those are the people that make sure that your UIF is paid. Medical aid, what are your staff benefits? And then they ensure that you are paid every single month. Then there's the cost accounting department. That's where you guys come into place. How much actually does it cost us to, to manufacture this product that we have, right? And then... There's cost control, then there's payroll accounting, schemes, types of remuneration that we have, payroll legislation, what do they mean, what do they require, cost accounting terms for payroll costs, the role of labor and technology, 
direct and indirect and non-manufacturing labor costs. So as I've said, there's a lot of terms, there's a lot of theory here um, that I would advise you to read through and understand. Because as I've said that sometimes these topics you think that are they not that important, but they come out in multiple choice. They will mostly ask them in multiple choice from what I've seen. Not to say that they might not, but I'm saying from what I've seen from your past papers. And accounting entries for labor remuneration. These are entries in financial accounting records, entries in the cost accounting records. So this is what we finally see on that income statement. It just says uh, salaries. but to get this final line item on our income statement, there's all of this that comes into play in order for us to understand the final number there. Okay. So the word labor is generally associated with the human effort and labor cost that is required for the production processes. And um, it is not fully automated because they don't have robots and 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 so for instance, um human effort. It's the people working, it's it's you, it's everyone working in part of that production process. Because if you can be replaced by a robot, that's a different situation. But if you are still working every single day, you are part of labor. Total labor cost includes of your gross amount due to an employee. And there's also employee benefits. So for other elements, if we go to the accounting entries, it's the HR people, they come with the policy. Those are the people who will tell you how much you need to get paid. These are the stuff that I was saying that you guys can you please just read, read on them because it's more of general knowledge to understand what constitutes the time clock method, uh, timekeeping department, what do they do, and also HR. Um, as I was saying, timesheets, I remember when I was doing articles, timesheets were very, very important, even in the consulting world when I was consulting. Timesheets were important because you tell them what time did you start, what time did you finish. And with us in, in uh, financial services, it's not quantity, but it's just to say, what were you doing? So timesheets, when we didn't submit timesheets, you don't get paid. So there was a certain time whereby HR will tell us that by, let's say, the 15th, I mean, by the end of the month of July, all timesheets needs to be submitted, but these timesheets needs to be submitted on a weekly basis. So they have a certain time where they're saying that payroll will start running. So if that's the case, you now need to make an estimation as to what will you be doing for the rest of the month? Where are you booked and what are the tasks that you need to do? So um, you would, on a weekly basis, you would need to submit your timesheet to indicate what you've done and how long did it take you. And if you are a manager of that audit, you would look at the target in terms of, for this task, did this person go over time or not? Because you have a budget, right? So I'm just giving you an example of a timesheet to indicate as to what you've done and how long did it take you, right? So I hope you guys are familiar with timesheets. Job cards, um, it would be, you know, um, besides job cards, I think also something that only tests the time but doesn't look necessarily into the tasks that you do. It would be, I don't know, maybe where you guys work, but you would have a tag. You would, you would, you would use on that turning uh, thing when you get into a building. You will tag to show that you came in, and you also tag when you leave. They do monitor those things and they refer to them just to make sure that you did come. I remember during my auditing days, there was something also that was very key that you tag. And they would even get us to a point where you have to write on the sheet of saying that you came in, attendance register to say that you came in. Because, yeah, during training days, people, they do get up to mischief. But we'll talk about those things in auditing if you do auditing, where a person will give someone their tag 
to come in on their behalf. So that's why they had to go an extra mile in terms of the control to say that it's an in attendance register, that tagging is not enough, you know? So other people use biometrics to open so that they can get in. But at the end of the day, it all comes into looking at to what time did you come in? What time did you leave? This time timesheet helps you to understand what is it that you're doing? How long does it take you? And that comes into the amount that you're getting paid as an employee. Are you paid in wages or salaries? Um, so, yeah, guys, please do look at the theory. As I've mentioned, that it's more of the term so that you do understand. But most of them, if you're in the working class, you do have an understanding as to how it works, right? Um, yes, and then there's URF, as I've mentioned. So let's get into this accounting entries, right? Because at the end of the day, you need to know how it gets into your books. So for each payroll period, when the wages are paid to the employees, deductions paid over to various inst institutions, this is what happens. So now this would be the company's books, right? They will show that this is what we paid in the Valeng, a net, net of her wages. And this is what goes to her pension fund. This is what goes to SARS. This is what goes to the UIF, and this is what goes to her medical aid. All these four, sorry, let me use my laser. All these four, one, two, three, four, they are, remain, what's this employee benefit? It's not like it's a thing that is, um, that everyone gets. It depends on your contract with your employer. So your contract, will indicate if this pension fund, if there would be a uh, payee, it's very important because that's SARS. But I'm just saying pension funds and also medical aid, that's employee benefits. So it's not all for us too. So it will depend on your contract with your employer. Some people, they will say that we'll give you the cost to company. Let me say 500. This is what you will get. So you will have to figure out which pension fund do you pay to. Do you want medical aid or not? But this is what we pay you. So it depends on your dynamics with your company. But at the end of the day, that's what goes when you are being paid. And then in terms of the production world that we're speaking of, it's just like with um, materials that we covered. The other part will be issued to WIP because we can trace this cost directly to the object that we are producing and that we're going to sell. So that will be your direct labor at recovery rate. We'll look at that. And then manufacturing is those indirect labor costs that you would have. And any admin, normally finance people will be here. Any admin people, people that are not directly um, traced to the object will be here. These are the people who are just controlling and making sure that things run smoothly. They will be here, and then you credit it out from your payroll wage control account. I hope you guys understand it um, in terms of the general entries. It's similar to the one for materials. It's just that at this moment, we talk about the labor. Okay? All right. Um, next one. It speaks about what I was saying. Idle time, clock hours productive hours. These terms, they do come up when you're doing standard costing. Because I, if I'm your, if I'm owning a company, I need to understand why is it that for this specific month, my, what I targeted as my uh, labor has exceeded or was more. So what I'm saying, was it over or under what I anticipated? So you would you would need to understand that, oh, okay, part of it was there was idle time, but idle time does not 
mean um so a person who has clocked in but not actively working owing to tea lunch time or schedule meetings because this person is not working towards production if you think about it so there's idle time where people are just not being productive right so if i'm an owner of a company if i've got a lot of meetings i'd be worried especially if you're owning a production company because now if you've got a lot of meetings happening almost every day when are the people going to get to a point where they start producing the product lunch time you would set it if you are a business owner to say that it's an hour you would look at the acts that are governing lunch time but then if a person is taking lunch time for 4 hours that's something that needs to be spoken um, about to say that it's 1 hour anything exceeding that that means it's not contributing to production cost i mean your production process tea time you must also be able to stipulate how long is your tea time even smoke time, because some people will spend more time on coffee times and uh, tea and smoke. Those things are, yes, they are good to have, but stipulate as to how long will you be able to allow, because it end up affecting your total costs, right? And then there's what's been clocked. This is related to the normal hours that a person would work. So let's say eight hours. Not, I mean, it would be eight hours. You exclude the normally you would exclude your lunch times and saying that on a normal basis I'd want someone to work for eight hours. And then the productivity, it's specific. It's what's expected for a person to work on that specific process. So if Jody is working on material, I'd say that Jody must spend two hours on that material to, on, before it gets issued to the next process where Marika will now have to take. So if Jody takes long because he's having more tea time and lunch time, it would be a problem for Marika because she would also be idle. So you would see that the process ends up being delayed, maybe because of one person. So you never already at the beginning when you see a red flag. So you'd see more of these when you're looking at standard costing. It's just that it's easier to understand now than later. Um, before I go to overheads, um, sorry, do you guys have any questions related to um, what I just mentioned in terms of labor costs? Overheads. So we've spoken about labor and how it's being accounted for. It's similar to materials and just be aware of what's idle, what's clock hours, productive hours, and the labor recovery rate that you use to calculate your labor that you transfer to your web. Now we look at overheads. So now overheads, sorry, normally it would be a thing of, it, it, it's a problem to allocate uh, overheads, because remember, direct material, you see the wood, you know that it goes directly to the desk. Labor, you know that for this section, for me to convert it, this specific person will be working on it. So it's easier. But then with overheads, it's, it's very tricky to know how to allocate it. So we look at the, how do you allocate your overheads? And also, how do you account for it? Understand the journals. And also, this is a bit of theory in terms of allocation basis, primary allocation, secondary allocation, and also the predetermined overhead rate. Um, but it's more of, I'm trying to make sure that you guys understand how manufacturing overheads are allocated. Because guess what? This topic, it reveals itself in uh, when you're doing a presentation. Is it direct or absorption costing uh, in terms of presentation? You will see the unit when you get there. Um, but probably because you guys have already done your assignment, you have covered it. But if you understood it from this topic, that topic that we will get to should be easier to navigate. All right. So with manufacturing overheads, manufacturing overheads, 
Um, they consist of indirect material, indirect labor costs, and other indirect expenses. So examples would be electricity, depreciation of your um, machine and your insurances. It's just an example of what your overheads are. But as I've mentioned, how you allocate the space is very important. Maybe let me pose it as a question for you guys to answer and then you guys can talk. Um, Uzel, you can text, um, and Marika, you can talk as to how, what's your understanding in terms of how manufacturing overheads needs to be applied to a product? Okay, um, how I understand it uh, is that the manufacturing overheads the, uh, is you have to use the budgeted amounts because of the fact that if you wait for the, all the costs to actually um, uh, incur, it, it will be too late because you must yes. know these costs beforehand. So you will have to use the, the budgeted amounts and then apply that well, monthly, daily, it depends on how you uh, how you have to calculate it or when you have to calculate it. But then you must use that applied um, amount that you have of uh, budget-wise and then multiply that to the actual quantity to to get to um, to get to your costs. That's, yes. that's how I un understand it. Yes, which is true. You using the applied manufacturing overheads. That budgeted overhead, I mean overhead allocation rate, is what you apply on your actual production, right? The reason why you're making an estimate as to what your manufacturing overheads would be by the end of the month, why or the end of the year, why we use that is because in normal instances, it might be a thing of that your actual manufacturing overheads, they would come at a later stage. So to avoid that, you use the applied manufacturing overheads to, to get an estimated cost. However, the minute that you have your actual coming in, you need to measure as to did you overestimate or did you underestimate. But then that movement between your applied and your actual, that would be an expense or a gain. It depends if it was you over or you underestimated. All right. So that's very key. And I'm glad that you, you guys understand it as to how it operates. Let me just open the chat to just make sure that I cater for um, Lisa. But that's how it works. And I, and, and I hope that you guys would, you, you would have applied this when you get to your direct and absorption which I think that you guys covered in your assignment. So the overhead recovery rate, as I've mentioned, is, is um, Marike uh, responded, it's your budgeted manufacturing overhead, and then your denominator would be an estimated production. This is your, how many uh, desks are you gonna produce for that specific period, right? So that would be the, that would be estimated. <laughs> So we can try look at section one and six point two just to illustrate this. And the unders and overs, I've explained that this is just to say, did I underestimate or did I overestimate, and what are the implications on my income statement because it affects your income statement. Um, let's go to six point one. It's also is easier, straightforward. We're not gonna do it it's just to discuss. So it's just to show the calculation for someone who maybe doesn't understand. We say that this would be you would be given your estimated cost for the year and also the estimated production output. At the end of the year, the company produced 242 units, which is the actual. You see now this is actual. This is what we estimated our production will be, but then what happened was that we did 242. And this is what you actually incurred in terms of your overhead. 
So they say calculate the applied manufacturing overhead. So you take the formula to say that this is what I estimate, this is my estimated rate to say budgeted cost over the budgeted units, you get 800 per unit. Then you apply that rate on your actual because you're making an estimation as to how your overheads would be. From what we're looking at at the moment, um, what happened? You underestimated, right? Because you're taking that 193, you compare it against the 196. And as a result, you underestimated. I hope you guys understand. Okay. So this is a, it's a, on 6.2, if they asked you to do the calc, you will see that the applied manufacturing overhead is 193, the actual is 196. So you underestimated by 2.4 thousand. All right, so I hope it's as straightforward as that. As I've said, it, it clips itself out when you have to now present yourself. So taking the very same example in 6.1, how do you account for it into your journals? Because at the end of the day, your labor, your material, and even overheads, you need to understand how do you account them in your books. So you would show that in my bank, right? When you debit, you because probably you would have as a journal you would have debited your manufacturing overheads and you credit your bank because that's what you actually paid right you show what you actually paid and then to your whip you transfer the applied overheads okay so there it is so you will take it out of your manufacturing and that's what you transfer to your whip and remember, under your whip, you will have also your material and your labor actuals. But when it comes to manufacturing, we use applied. Okay. So the under and over, as I've mentioned, it will become an expense. The overheads were under applied in the cost of production. This is the same balance that we spoke about. So this is how you would un you would take into account your under and over. So it's very important that you understand how to calculate the applied overheads, know to, how to record in your manufacturing overhead. We take into account what's being actually paid and what you estimated. What you estimated, you take it to a whip and whatever that's an over and under, that would be your cost. Okay. I hope it was straightforward there. And um, this was just to illustrate that as part of the um, applied rate that we we're talking about, where it says budgeted cost over your budgeted units, those units, they all depend. But normally in the past papers that you guys have, they would show, uh, they would tell you what your denominator uh, needs to be. So in instances where an environment is labor intensive, you use direct labor hours, right? Uh, raw materials will be appropriate where raw material volumes drive the overhead. Um, so this part, it will reveal itself when you are doing ABC. ABC, it helps you to know how to allocate according to what drives the cost. So the driver of the cost would be your denominator. So what I'm trying to say is that all of these topics, they help you if you understand the concepts here. By the time you get to the next topic, you will be able to link. So from this topic, we saw that it might reveal itself in um, standard costing. It might reveal itself in um, direct versus absorption costs. It might reveal itself also under ABC because ABC says that, hey, don't apply a blanket rate. Try to look at what drives the cost. So this would be one of the factors that don't fixate yourself to say it's always production. No, it's not always for production. We can also look at other 
non-financial basis and also financial basis. So I hope you guys understand that part. Um, so as I've said, there's this thing called the blanket overhead where I was talking about ABC. So blanket overhead rate, maybe before I talk, just to check if you guys understand it. What is it? Okay, um, how I understand the blanket um, overhead is uh, you can have multiple products, but it is the same uh, overhead that is allocated to all of them. But to but it's not quite accurate because yeah if the the one product doesn't use never uses the same amount of overheads as the next yes so hence the ABC yeah yes yeah. yes yes correctly I'm comfortable with that and I hope also Lizelle you are comfortable with that to say that with the blanket read it's just like just um you're not looking specifically as to what drives the cost of each department. You just say that um, for all these departments, I'm going to look at volumes. Irrespective of what happens in the specific uh, departments. And in normal instances, you might find that the one with the highest volumes would take the largest part of the cost, right? So I'd have an overhead Let's say with electricity, I'm going to make an example of electricity where it's 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 a yes. Let's just use electricity or rent, but I'm just going to use electricity. So I'm going to say that rent and I'm I mean electricity, sorry, and I'll just say volume. So the one with the highest volumes will take um, the larger part of that electricity bill, while as the others are chilling and having lesser cost. This is the old way. This is where when you get to ABC, you will see that it's the more traditional ways of allocating costs as opposed to ABC, which says, look at the driver, because if department B, which has the largest volume, takes the most part, chances are it might not be profitable, because we we'll always have this huge base of my manufacturing cost that I need to swallow. And as a result, I won't be able to even break even and I'll be making a loss. And then because you're a management accountant, you end up advising a person wrongly to say that just discontinue making this product. Why? Because it's charging a lot of costs. It's making a lot of costs where you're not making a profit. While as if you use ABC, you'll understand for this specific department what's driving their costs. And you might find that, hey, actually, when I use ABC, Department B is a profitable department as opposed to Department A, you know. So as a management accountant, your job is to advise people based on the tools that we have, the tools that we are learning here. You'll be able to give uh, valuable input. You'll be able to make um, good decisions which will impact the profitability of your product. That's why people hire management accountants. That's why you guys are doing the subject, so that you can be able to give uh, valuable input to people who make decisions as to the direction of a company. If you have your own business, use the principles that you learn here, because they will be able to help you analyze if you are making a profit or not. And you will have conclusive reasons or factors that you would have thought of for you to end up saying that, should I continue doing this business or should I pull out? Okay. I hope that's straightforward. So yeah, that was the blanket rate method, the traditional one. Manufacturing overheads, this is a bit of theory to say, how do you treat your manufacturing overheads where separate departments exist? So there's a primary allocation where all overheads, e.g. your rent, your salaries are divided among all the departments in the organization, including the service departments and your non-production departments. So they don't look at the fact that yeah, um, if you are in service or if you're in production, they just apply to all. Then there's the secondary where accumulated overheads from step one of service department are allocated to production and non-production departments. So 
An example is the maintenance department reallocates its total manufacturing overheads to production departments and dispatch departments. In this way, all production related overheads are finally accumulated solely in various departments. So just understand the difference between the two, because as I've said, such things they do come up um, as part of your multiple choice. So you want to get to a part where you see it and you're like, ah, I know I've seen it somewhere. Just try to understand what's the difference between the two. So in summary, before we do question one and three, then we close off today's class. Um, we looked at how to um, how to do the budgeted predetermined overhead recovery rate. We looked at uh, this budget, this applied, and then this actual manufacturing cost. How do you do your overs and unders? We looked at how do you account for them in terms of your general entries. Very, very important. And also, um, we, we, we looked at the blanket rate and also this primary and secondary allocation. So that was a mouthful in terms of manufacturing overhead and also with labor and material. As I've mentioned, today's class was a bit of theory, but it was very important because it links to, it was a merging of accounting and auditing all in one in management accounting so that you understand why you do certain things. So let's try to look at Question one, inside the module, should give us time. Question one and question three, just to make sure that I see that you guys understand what we're speaking about. It's a bit straightforward, but it's just for you to calculate. Yeah, let's do question three, rather question one, I think you guys understand how to calculate uh, what we spoke about. So let's do question three. I'll give you guys 10 minutes or 15 rather, because it's a bit long to read. Um, and then we'll share your thought process, then we'll be done for the day. Let me put it here. Let me see. Okay, that's four questions. So 15 minutes. So Terra Limited manufactures toys. The monthly average budgeted fixed production related to overhead is 290,500. The budgeted overhead recovery rate is based on the following methodology. The primary allocation takes place on the following basis. This production department and the service fee. Then they tell you how it's being allocated, right? Then the secondary allocation is on the service provision basis. The service department is to renders a service to all departments, whereas S1 uh, provides service to production departments only. So S2, it provides to all, but then S1 only to production. Secondary allocation and the budgeted fixed overhead rate are based on the following hours. So they tell you P1, P2, these are the labor hours. And then management will like you to estimate the overhead cost of the toys for December. So they want you to do an applied overhead. The following actual information is what they gave us from June till December. They gave you the hours and they gave you the total overheads. But for December, remember, that's what we're trying to estimate. What would be our overheads, right? So now, question comes and says calculate. So it's very formula driven. Calculate the total budget fixed overheads to recover. So per production, just highlight. Do I even have a color? Cool. So they want the total budgeted fixed overhead per production. And then they want the budget and they want total, please, total. No? And the budgeted fixed overhead recovery rate per production. 
and then they want you to calculate the actual fixed cost. Ah, uh, yo, yes, this will be nice. Yes, they want you. Sorry, guys, I got excited because it will show me if you also understood last week's question, saying that calculate the actual fixed cost and the variable fixed cost using high low. Let's do A, B, and C. Okay, so that is for for A. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, make sure. So uh, I first uh, first of all I jotted all the uh, all the departments. So it's uh, P one to S two. Uh, mm -hmm. I jotted that down, and then uh, because of the fact that they said, let me just quickly go that the uh, that the average uh, well that the uh, overhead cost uh, of two hundred and nineteen thousand five hundred must be split between all. All with those five departments. So yeah. then I took first of all, if uh, the primary cost must be done first. Yes. So it is the two hundred and nineteen thousand five hundred, and I took uh, all those percentages: the forty percent, twenty percent, twenty percent, ten percent, ten percent. I worked that out. Uh, do you want me to give the amount as well? Yeah, I think it's no. fine. You can, you can okay, I can just uh, go through my uh, my thought yeah, process. I just want to hear your thoughts. Okay. Process, that's it. Okay, so then I got to those amounts. Then after that, I went through. Uh, I went to the secondary allocation. Yes. So the secondary allocation started with S two because of the fact that uh, the service department uh, gives service to all of the departments, all. and uh, and it's going to be included into service department one, which is later on going to be uh, broken down or split up. So I got to S2, uh, the total is 21,950. Mm. I said uh, 21,950 times the hours of that specific department divided by the total hours of all the departments. Yes. Yes. So then that is how I split those up from P1, P2, P3, yeah. and S1. Perfect. At the end, I then I got to uh, a new balance where S service department two is zero, mm -hmm. and the service department has a new balance of twenty two thousand six hundred and fifty and fifty eight. Correct. So then that amount uses it's the same principle as what you started with with S two. You'd say that new amount the twenty two thousand blah 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 times the hours per department divide by three thousand. Yes. Hours, yes, because now it is it now it's less hours. Mm. Right. So then that gave me other balances. I added all of them up, uh, then got to a specific amount. Yeah. So the, yeah. yes. Yeah. Happy so new total. I am happy with your thinking process. Um yeah. Oh shim that important. But I'm happy with that process, the, the, how you were allocating it, and I hope also Giselle, if you have any question, you let us know. It's, to, it's important to read the question to say that they think per department, understand primary allocation, what it entails, and I think what is key is that S2 has to be allocated for all other departments because that's what they said they will do, but then for S1, it was only for the production. Uh, departments. So just being able to separate those two and carry forward the balances as you go. So thank you for that. Um, with the budgeted re recovery uh, rate, that one, you, I think what I wanted to display is that they are using labor hours now and not using production. So it's overheads. It's what you would have allocated to those specific production because they said it's production departments that they are focusing on. So it's what would you would have been able to allocate to those uh, production costs, I mean, production department, and use the specific labor hours of those departments in order to get your recovery rate. So I hope that one was a bit straightforward. And then with the high-low, you needed to remember last week, I think I did tell you guys that sometimes before you even get to the required, you will see from how your information is being given. So I'm trying to teach you, it's an exam technique to say that um, maybe it's because by the time if you guys choose the CA route, if you're doing um, 
CTA, you need to be, even when you get to board exams, you need to be able to identify what you might be asked before you even get to the question so that by the time you get to the question, you're not surprised. So one of the tricks is that high-low questions, they normally don't say, oh, here's the high-low information below, if you get what I mean. So in most instances, you will see it's either a table or something structured like this where you'd have different numbers and then there would be the highest and the lowest. So what I'm trying is to say is that it won't be given like this, but it's normally information of your denominator and your uh, numerator will be there, but in like different levels. It could be months, it could be whatever that you'll be using um, to show the different amounts. So by just looking at this, you can see the chances are I might be asked a high-low question. If you guys get what I mean, if you don't understand, please do uh, raise it in the chat. But what I'm trying to say is that high-low method, you are given a range, a range, and it will have your denominator, meaning what would be your underlying thing that you're dividing. Sometimes it's hours, sometimes it's production, and you'll be given costs. But as I've said, the range has the highest and the lowest, and then, lo and behold, you will be asked to do a high-low calculation because a high-low, you have to look at the difference between the highest and lowest cost and highest and lowest hours or whatever it might be. That will be the driver of the cost. So I hope just be alert that high-low, they won't just say, here's the high-low information below. Be able to sniff and identify it before they ask you because by the time you get to answering C, you would know where's the highest, where's the lowest. Let me do the calc quickly. So it saves you time. That's what I'm trying to say. And if you are not strong, we will do exam technique as we get this, just that now we have to go through all these topics. But what I'm trying to say is that when we do questions, you always start with the one that you understand that is easy marks. Because firstly, it builds your morale to say that, okay, I'm going to tackle this question. It reduces this time spent while doing a question. So always, always start with what you know. So if I was able to read here, the chances are they're going to ask me a high-low, and I find that it's, it's C, and I'm not strong with doing A. I'm not strong with doing B because B needs A answers. Then I start with C. Because at least I'll reduce the time spent here and be able to start thinking, how do I tackle A? Do you guys get me? So when you're doing questions, when you're giving an answer, you don't have to be starting on a chronological order to say, I have to start with A, B, C, and D. Always start with what you know. Always start with the easiest marks. So what, what I'm saying, what you know is what you're strong at, that you know that if it's a six, six mark, I'm going to get six out of six. Not a thing of, A, maybe I might get 50% of it. No, that's not your strongest. Start with your strongest, which is high-low in this instance. And um, if you guys got the, it's straightforward because the information is there, and then there's the linear equation. And then you even use the linear equation for D but we didn't do D. So um, with that being said, guys, um, were you guys able to see what I was sharing? I hope you were. I hope you were. Um, but what I'm, what I'm explaining is that do lots of question. I still say management accounting is like maths. Practice, practice question. Don't underestimate the questions that are in the module because they build you up that by the time we do past papers, because we're going to do past papers, you should be um, having these tools. You should have practiced under no time pressure. You would have understood the principles. And then by the time you do the questions, you'll be able to practice exam technique. Exam technique is about how fast you answer the question and what is your thought process. 
I'm, I ask you guys to do the question and give me your thought process, not necessarily if the answer is right or wrong, because it's your thought process that's going to carry you when you do the exam. When you do the exams, that thought process should be automatic to know that this is what I'm going to start with and this is how it will flow for me to end up having this answer. Then having a thought process also reduces the time that you spend on questions because exam technique, you find you'll be able to identify questions that are time trappers saying that this one, they're just trying us, they're trapping us with the time because they know it's going to take us longer. So if that's the case, time trappers, you say that you'll do it last. Rather get the easier marks, get your six, get your two, because when you add them together, you might be surprised that 40% of the paper you already pass you, you just need 10 or whatever your target might be to say that you want 60 or 70 or distinction. And that's when you will spend the time on your time trappers. But it will make sense once we do exam papers. Thank you for attending today.